Okay, so this is the third lecture in the what is knowledge topic, and this is going to focus mainly on the responses to Gettier's objection. So just to set that up, let's have a quick look at what we've covered so far. The key points are going to be the tripartite definition of knowledge, the central definition that this whole topic revolves around with propositional knowledge is that knowledge is a justified true belief. Uh, what was Gettier's objection to this? Why was this so important? Um, and you would need to be able to explain at least one Gettier type example, a Gettier case to show the point that he was trying to make. It doesn't necessarily need to be the ones that he used, but you need to be able to explain at least one of these examples. This is the sort of question that you would get on the um, definition of knowledge here. So explain the tripartite definition of knowledge and Gettier's objection. Uh, this is a 12 mark question. And remember, those often take this form of having two parts. So in this case, explaining the tripartite definition and then the second part being explaining Gettier's objection to it. So roughly just to recap, um, this would involve uh, initially using the terms necessary and sufficient to explain the um, tripartite definition. So uh, the key thing there is that the justification condition is supposed to rule out luck uh, and establish jointly sufficient conditions for knowledge. So necessary, remember, means something that has to be in place for us to have the thing that we're looking at. So necessary conditions for knowledge are supposed to be justification, truth and belief. They are necessary because if you take one of them away, you no longer have knowledge. So each of them is required to be there to make the thing that we're talking about. And then uh, sufficient means something is automatically enough if it's sufficient. So if we have the three conditions present, these are supposed to be automatically enough to make something an instance of knowledge. So the key intuition, remember, for this whole topic is that knowledge is different to a lucky truth. So you cannot just stumble across the truth by coincidence. It needs to be properly justified, hence the three conditions. So hence the justification condition here. And you need to be able to give examples to try and show, OK, well, you know, if I've just guessed the, the lottery numbers or I have a particularly strong hunch about the lottery numbers, um, and they turn out to be the ones that I picked. I didn't know the lottery numbers because I wasn't justified. That's why we have the justification condition here. Now, that's the first part of the question. That's your first six marks in terms of the question here. Secondly, you would then want to explain Gettier's point, um, which was that the, the three conditions are in fact not jointly sufficient because you can have uh, lucky uh, justified true beliefs. So he, he's giving these examples, remember, which are, are supposed to demonstrate that you can have justification and truth and belief, yet still not know the thing because uh, there can be an element of coincidence or luck. So there's several examples that you could use for this. Uh, Gettier's own example is the Smith and Jones example where the two people are going for the, the job Smith has been told by the president of the company that Jones will probably get the job and he knows independently that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. So he forms this belief that the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. It in fact, turns out that Smith himself gets the job and coincidentally himself has 10 coins in his pocket. So he didn't, according to Gettier, um, know that the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket, even though he had a justified true belief. There's several other examples. We'll mention some of them uh, as we go through this uh, lesson today. It's worth perhaps just considering where we draw the line with knowledge and justification, because some of what we look at today will we'll try and play on this. A um, couple of things for you to think about. So if you buy a lottery ticket and you have, let's say, a one in a 45 million um, chance of winning the jackpot. Do you know that you won't win the jackpot? Uh, and what stops you from knowing that? 
Is this the same uh, if you park your car outside where there is a chance that it might have been stolen? Do you know that your car is outside? And thirdly, perhaps if there is a chance, however slim, that you are merely a brain in a vat, do you know that you're not a brain in a vat? Going back to the scepticism topic that we talked about with the possibility that your uh, kind of chemicals and um, what have you are being manipulated to make you think that you are in fact engaging in a, a philosophy lesson. Um, but actually, that's not the case. So where do we draw the line? What do we say is knowledge here? And, and um, where does kind of chance uh, and certainty come in? OK, so that will come up with some of the examples that we have a look at here. So where we've come to so far, we've said, OK, this is this tripartite definition of knowledge. The traditional definition of knowledge says that uh, it's a justified and true belief that goes back to Plato. We've looked at some objections which say, well, maybe those conditions aren't in fact individually necessary. Perhaps we could do away with one of them. And we looked at some examples about how that might work and try to analyze a little bit what we mean by truth and justification, which we'll come back to later on as well. Um, for the most part, though, this debate revolves around responding to Gettier's famous objection. So we've just outlined why he thinks that the um, three conditions are not sufficient. They're not automatically enough to generate knowledge because you can have cases of justified true beliefs, which are in fact still lucky truths. So what we're trying to do here is to try to eliminate these Gettier cases from counting as knowledge and to come up with a more secure, uh, watertight definition of knowledge, which avoids these kinds of examples and gives us a more believable uh, and perhaps secure definition of knowledge. So there are four separate responses to Gettier that we need to know, and we're going to have a look at just two of these today. So um, firstly, I want to consider why might adding the infallible condition to justify true belief help avoid Gettier type examples. So uh, some of these responses will be adding a condition to our traditional definition to try and avoid or eliminate these examples of luck. Um, some of them will be changing slightly the definition overall. So infallibilism is the first response. Uh, we'll also try and evaluate this a bit, see if this works, if this is any better. Um, and then the second uh, response that I wanted to look at was the no false lemmas response. Um, this also is adding something on to the JTB definition um, and we'll see how that works and whether this in fact is, is better and whether it deals with the kind of Gettier examples that we've mentioned before. OK, so firstly, infallibilism then. So we are trying to show that there could be a way of eliminating or avoiding the Gettier type examples by adding on something to our definition and trying to say, OK, this is a, a better and more secure definition of knowledge. So if something is infallible in this context generally means can't be mistaken in our context, it means something which cannot be rationally doubted. So this is supposed to generate uh, certainty, not a sort of psychological feeling of certainty, but actual certainty, something that cannot uh, legitimately be criticized or mistaken in an objective sense. Something infallible cannot be wrong. Um, so this is something which is going to be one way of getting around the, the Gettier type example. So how would this work? Well, Gettier cases arise due to the gap between justification and knowledge. So why not close this gap by making only that which is 100% certain knowledge? So 
for instance, there is a gap between the justification in the Smith and Jones example and the knowledge because uh, Smith thought that he was justified in believing that Jones would get the job when in fact himself, uh, he himself got the job. Um, we could perhaps think about the stopped clock example similarly. Um, if you look at the, the clock and it's telling the correct time, but in fact it has stopped. This um, seems to be uh, having an element of justification, but it's, it's not 100% certain. So that's going to be a, a, an issue here. So infallibilism avoids these Gettier cases by ruling out lucky truths and admitting only beliefs which could not be false, which could not be rationally doubted. Now, both the Smith and Jones case and the stopped clock case, um, remember both of those cases are cases which could be rationally doubted. So those would not count as knowledge under this new amended definition. Okay, so just to clarify on those examples then, so by adding the infallibility condition, we would avoid Gettier's example of Smith getting the job, uh, counting as knowledge because his belief there was not certain. It turned out that Jones would not get the job despite what he was told by the president. His evidence suggested that Jones would get the job, but in fact he uh, himself got the job. So this was a fallible belief. This was something which was open to doubt. It was open to um, being wrong. And, and in fact, um, it turned out to be a coincidence that he himself had the 10 coins in his pocket. So uh, he, he didn't have knowledge uh, in this case on this new amended definition. Likewise, in the clock example, um, the, the belief there is not something which is 100% uh, certain. We happen to have glanced at the clock at the correct time, um, not realising that the clock in fact had stopped. So this would be something which wouldn't count uh, as knowledge on the infallibilist um, amended definition because it was something which is possible for, for it to be rationally doubted. So this would not count as knowledge there. So in these cases, adding the infallible condition avoids Gettier type examples and it prevents such lucky cases from being included as knowledge by tightening up our definition and ruling out anything that could be rationally doubted. So this is supposed to advance our definition of knowledge and make it more secure uh, and less open to these Gettier type uh, examples. OK, so infallibilism tries to get us out of the Gettier problem by tightening up the definition and, and saying that only those uh, beliefs which are 100% certain uh, count as knowledge. Um, is this any good, though? Um, there's, there's one very important criticism that we can make, I think, of infallibilism here, which is that it's criticised as being much, much too strict. So it seems to actually rule out much of what we would ordinarily accept as knowledge, such as beliefs formed through experience, which, remember, are all open to sceptical doubt. Going back to the kind of brains and vats example, the Descartes case of the evil demon, um, we could be mistaken, misled, manipulated uh, in all of these ways by the, the evil demon or the uh, kind of brain in vat scenario, such that everything that we ordinarily take to be knowledge, more or less, would be uh, not knowledge under this definition. If only those things which cannot be rationally doubted would count as knowledge, that leaves us with a very small uh, set of what we would consider knowledge um, for, for people like Plato and Descartes, perhaps only, you know, maths uh, and geometry. So in this sense, infallibilism is, is criticised often as being too strict and as setting the bar 
too high uh, to properly define how we ordinarily use the term knowledge. Perhaps it's more defining what knowledge should be, um, or perhaps a, a definition more of certainty than uh, ordinary everyday knowledge. So it's, it's counterintuitive. It seems to take us too far away from how we actually use the term knowledge. So this is one big problem with infallibilism, but there, there may be a way of amending this to um, make it less restrictive. So perhaps we could consider what a more moderate infallibilist position uh, might look like. So a more moderate infallibilist might soften their position and perhaps say that we need not rule out every single skeptical possibility. So we could be brains in vats, controlled by an evil demon and so on and so on. We only need to rule out the relevant alternatives. So perhaps we could say, um, if you meet a friend, say, and they have a tan, uh, you might not know if they've been on holiday, but to establish this, you don't need to prove that you're not a brain in a vat. Um, that's not a relevant alternative here. You might just need to rule out whether they've been to a tanning salon. So the doubt that we are applying shouldn't necessarily be a completely thoroughgoing doubt which extends to the sort of brains in vats evil demon scenario it could be a restricted doubt which just applies to relevant alternatives given the situation so the salon here would be a relevant alternative explanation whereas the brain in the vat scenario perhaps wouldn't be a, a relevant um, scenario. So maybe we could sort of draw a compromise here and say, well, relevant alternatives should be considered uh, and we should try and eliminate those um, when we're doubting the particular uh, belief that we're talking about. But we don't need to go as far uh, as Descartes uh, in doubting absolutely everything. So perhaps that's something which would deal with Gettier cases, but not be susceptible to this uh, criticism that it's much, much too strict. So we've looked at one attempt to respond to Gettier, the infallibilist response, and, and seen that that uh, has some problems. And, and we've done a little bit of evaluation uh, of infallibilism. The second main response that I wanted to cover in this uh, lesson was the no false lemmas response. Um, so this is taking a slightly different tack and may or may not be uh, more successful. So remember what we're trying to do is to create a amended definition of knowledge which avoids Gettier examples and gives us a sort of intuitive and believable uh, definition of how we use the term knowledge, which properly captures uh, the sort of thing that we would usually count as knowledge. So this is going to involve uh, a, a term here, a lemma. And a lemma is a term in, in logic for an underlying belief or assumption. Um, it's also worth pointing out in this context that we'll be talking about inferences. We've talked about this through the course, but just to spell out and to remind you, an inference is a step in an argument that leads on to something else. So if you infer something from something else, then you're making a sort of step, a logical link from one thing to another. So this response attempts to pinpoint where Getty examples go wrong by picking out the false or mistaken inference or step that generates the luckily true conclusion. So if you think of any of the Gettier type examples, uh, Smith and Jones, the stopped clock, that there is usually a, a step within that argument, within that set of inferences, which is false or mistaken. So, <clears throat> In the Smith and Jones example, Smith falsely believes that Jones will get the job. And this is the false lemma which generates the conclusion that the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket, which, uh, of course, we know turns out to be true. Only it's Smith himself rather than Jones. So in this case, we have a, a mistaken inference, a false lemma. So by adding on, 
uh, and, and no false lemmas condition to our response, then perhaps we can get around and avoid the sort of cases that are generated by Gettier examples and come up with a more believable uh, definition of what knowledge genuinely is. So this excludes cases which rely on these false lemmas uh, and excludes uh, Gettier examples, at least according to uh, the way that we've put it so far. So does this work? Is this any better? Um, well, perhaps we could consider some of the examples. Um, maybe the no false lemmas response doesn't in fact count for all of the examples. Maybe it doesn't exclude the sorts of lucky cases that we really want to exclude here. So um, for instance, think of the fake barn example where someone passes through, say, a film set filled with faked barns uh, and notices uh, a real barn at the end uh, of all the fake ones. So they believe they saw a real barn when they did see a real barn. But the context in this case is supposed to show that it was a lucky truth. They could have looked up at any point and seen a fake barn. It just so happens that they looked up at the end and saw the real one. Now, this was a, a very, very lucky um, kind of instance, according to this example. Uh, and that luck is supposed to, remember, uh, stop us from having knowledge. Knowledge is not supposed to be a lucky truth, but this seems to be a lucky truth. This is a controversial example. Um, it's supposed to show that there are no false assumptions here, but is still a lucky truth. In other words, it's supposed to be an instance of a Gettier example, which involves no false lemmas. So <clears throat> this is sometimes used to criticize the no false lemmas response because you're not actually relying on anything um, which is a mistake here at least according to the way that we've read the example so far. Some people would want to say, actually, um, this just is knowledge, um, that the context in this um, example does not rule this out from being knowledge. Um, but this is something where I think you'll have to make your own mind up. Does the context here genuinely show that this was uh, lucky, therefore not knowledge, or because the person did see the real barn, um, did they actually genuinely know that it was a real barn? Other examples that I think we mentioned in the booklet with the Boris Johnson lookalike day, where perhaps uh, somebody sees uh, the real Boris Johnson riding by on a bike, um, but actually didn't know that there was lots of uh, Boris Johnson's riding around on bikes because it was in fact Boris Johnson lookalike day. This again is a sort of fake barn example where the context is supposed to make it unlikely that you would come across the truth, but you did see the real Boris Johnson. Um, it's just unlikely that you would have done given that there were lo loads of Boris Johnson's riding around on their bikes on this day. An alternative type example might be um, the one that uh, Jennifer Nagel gives in, in her excellent videos on this topic. Um, she talks about something where a detective rightly believes that a suspect is guilty of a crime and they form this belief based on 100 eyewitnesses giving testimony uh, which the detective takes to be truthful. Um, but it turns out that one of the eyewitnesses was lying. So in this context, it seems that the detective has inferred their belief that the person is, is guilty, which is true, um, on the basis of, very strictly speaking, a false lemma, that all of their uh, eyewitnesses were telling the truth, but actually one of them uh, wasn't. One of them was lying in this instance. Now, that seems to show that if it's relying on a false lemma, it can't be knowledge. But this seems to be a pretty clear cut case where she does know that the person is guilty. There's 99 people telling the truth uh, and only one person lying. So this seems to be a, a, an example which again raises problems for the no false lemmas example.
So does that mean it isn't knowledge? This again is something that you will have to make a, a call on. Okay, so we've looked at two central responses to Gettier so far. Um, and these are the central questions that we want to be clear on at the end of this lesson. So we want to be clear um, going back right to the start about what Gettier's objection was to justify true belief counting as knowledge. Remember, he was trying to show that those conditions were not sufficient. They weren't enough to generate knowledge. We've then looked at uh, infallibilism and how that tries to deal with Gettier examples by uh, ruling out anything that can be rationally doubted. So any sort of belief or any sort of uh, instance that could be incorrect or mistaken or doubted uh, prevents uh, that from being knowledge. Now we said that was a perhaps problematic definition because it was too strict uh, and we looked at perhaps ways of amending it to get around that issue. And then finally we've considered the no false lemmas response which tries to get around Gettier examples in a different way by saying only those um, beliefs which do not rely on false assumptions would count as knowledge. Uh, and this again perhaps rules out some of the kind of Gettier examples like the Smith and Jones ones, but might not rule all of them out. Uh, and this is where we have to consider just how far we consider the idea of context um, and what we would consider to be false lemmas and, and how important those are. So those are the first two responses to Gettier. Um, there are two further responses that we're going to look at, but you should hopefully be able to, to think through now how far you think that these adequately respond to and deal with Gettier type examples.